Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. And what a pleasure it is to have these two writers back to the library, if only virtually. John Banville joins us today, today to discuss his new novel, The Singularities. A recent reviewer in the Boston Globe writes, reading John Banville is like being in the presence of a fathomlessly talented, witty, and intelligent magician. Someone so captivatingly masterful at their craft, you suspect they could make you disappear. If you want to know what I mean, read Banville's new novel, which proves the 76-year-old Irish author deserves a summons from Stockholm. John Banville won the Man Booker Prize for The Sea, Story of Loss and the Fickle Nature of Memory. His many other works include The Book of Evidence, The Newton Letter, Mephisto, Dr. Copernicus, and April in Spain. He has earned numerous prizes, including the Irish Penn Award, the Franz Kafka Prize, and the Prince of Asturias Award, Spain's most prestigious literary honor. A fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, Banville is also an acclaimed playwright, nonfiction writer, screenwriter, and crime novelist under the pseudonym Benjamin Black. Today, he'll be in conversation with Colin McCann, National Book Award-winning novelist of Let the Great World Spin, writer in residence at Hunter College and co-founder of the nonprofit Global Story Exchange Narrative 4. John, Colin, I'm happy to have you back. The screen is yours. Thank you so much, John. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to see you. A great pleasure to be here, here virtually, as we say. And, you know, every time I, um, every time I, I, I read uh, a book of yours, and I've had uh, like a fantastic time over the past couple of weeks with the singularities, but every time I, I, I read you, um, I think back on the days when we happened to coincide briefly uh, in the uh, the offices of the Irish Press. I was one of the the, the junior reporters on the far side, hanging out with Con Houlihan and the rest of them. And, 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 and you were famously uh, at the at the uh, at the copy uh, copy desk and, and we'd watch our material go uh, through your your fabled hands. Uh, and uh, do you remember those long rolls of paper that we had and, the, and, and uh, you know, we'd type it all up on, on, on typewriter, the rattle of typewriter going go, going through the, the, the whole thing. All those days are gone, but they're not gone from my memory. Oh yes, they were. They were. They were such fun. I mean, look, we were working on that newspaper, the Irish Press, in terrible days. Terrible days. Uh, the wars of religion. They were having their last, their last flare out in Ireland in the seventies and eighties, uh, and they were terrible times. But I was. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say we had such fun. We laughed and laughed and laughed. Um, there's something about the camaraderie. I, I know this is an awful cliche, but something about the camaraderie of a newspaper office because it's so frenetic. There's always a deadline. You know, the whole thing is going to end by midnight. You know, you've worked all day. You guys have gone out. You've I mean, I was always fascinated by reporters. You know, there don't seem to be any reporters anymore. Everybody's a journalist now. In my days, there were reporters. And the news editor would say to somebody like you, you know, there's a fire at a convent, you know, go out and have a look at it. And you'd go out and you'd come back an hour later and write 600 words on a fire at a convent or a factory or some horrible atrocity had taken place. I was fascinated by that because I could not for a moment have been able to do that. I wouldn't have known where to start. Whereas you guys came back, and, as you say, on the typewriters uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and then, of course, we would, because we were copy editors, we would take your words and, <laughs> and change them. Our editor at the time, Shape them uh, we, we, we stopped being incestuous in, in a minute, but our editor, our editor of the newspaper at the time, uh, Tim Pat Coogan, who hated copy editors. I remember him defining us one day as one day as the people who change other people's words and go home in the dark. And he was right because, of course, we worked at night, uh, so we wouldn't leave till four in the morning. But they were. It's not just nostalgia. We did have such such fun. Yeah, I hope 
people in newspapers are having the same kind of fun now. I don't think they are. I don't think they are. And and the, 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 there was a toughness about the work. Um, and, you know, my father was a, a an editor there uh, as well. And um, it, we would be at home and he wasn't a drinker, but but a, a lot of the time the journalists and the writers would come out from town uh, for, um, and come out to our house, which is on Clonkeen Road in, in Dean's Grange, about seven miles out from town. And they'd have a taxi and they'd knock on the door and it would be, you know, Ben Kiley and Con Hulahan and, and whoever else it happened to be uh, looking for an advance on one of their stories and to get, you know, 20 quid. And I promise you, the copy came back uh, the, the next week. But the great thing was you could almost hear the taxi sloshing away from the house on the way down to the pub. So but the, the, it was hard thinking and hard drinking and also like. Uh, supreme, uh, some supreme writers, the, the likes of, say, Ben Kiley, and, and, and even in in earlier years, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, Flann O'Brien and what sort of influence he might have had uh, on you uh, as, a, as a writer and a reader. Well, I mean, Flann O'Brien was a, a... I think his tragedy was he stayed in Ireland all the others had gone, you know, Joyce had gone, Beckett had gone, uh, and he stayed. And I think he would have been greater if he had left Ireland. Uh, I mean, he did drink too much. You know, we can, we can be jolly and, you know, warm in our reminiscences of those days, but so many talents were destroyed or at least maimed by the pub culture, you know. You went up to McDay's, you went up to wherever, and you talked yourself away for the night when they should have been at home sleeping so that they could up, get up next day and do real work. Now, Flann O'Brien did astonishing work. That's right. Uh, I think his masterpiece is The Third Policeman, very dark book, not well known, not as well known as the Twin Two Birds and so on. Very, very dark. Yeah, Jordan and I had a plan once to make a movie of it. I still would love to do it. It'd be very hard to do. But they were strange, dark, maimed people. Uh, they were all men, apart from, I don't know, May Lavin, maybe. Yeah. There were a few women, but it was all, it was a male culture. And it was drink, and it was bravado, and it was braggadocio. And it was, you know, it was tragic. So, so much talent was lost to drink and to, and to talk, mere talk. Right. Talk is easy. But, um, you know, there's... We'll discover, as we'll discover over the next half hour. Well, we'll see. Um, I want to talk um, uh, immediately, then jump into um, the singularities. Uh, it's a stunning, a stunning book, um, and I, I found it very, very, very funny. Um, you know, it follows on from the Book of Evidence, and it follows on from the Infinities, obviously. But even the title itself um, uh, is a sort of joke, uh, in the, in the sense that there's a, the, 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 there's the plural of. Uh, uh, you know, the, the singularity. Um, and yet it's not a joke uh, because it plays into um, scientific theories and, and, and um, it delves into to areas of, of, of the, the quantum, the muon, the gluon, the, you know, the, um, the, the stuff of science. Um, talk to us about, um, about the singularities. And uh, the question I suppose I have is, well, I'd, I'd like to talk about the title, but I'd also like to, to ask you, if you had fun in in writing this book, because there's a great sense of fun in reading it, uh, but I'm not so sure that you had fun in writing it. I'm, uh, I'd like to know. Well, it depends what you mean by fun. Um, I had, yes, I had fun. I, you know, I, I knew early on that this was going to be my last book of this kind. Uh, it took me five, six years to write. You know, I'm 76 now. I'm not going to undertake that kind of book again. So I was revisiting my previous work. I was doing a, a summing up, but also I wanted it to be light. I wanted it to be, you know, I mean, you know yourself, we talk very solemnly about our work and so on, but really the artist's first 
instinct in first job was to provide delight for readers or viewers or listeners. So I wanted to, to delight my readers. It's hard work, but nothing wrong with hard work. I mean, what else would I be doing with my time? Well, I, exactly. I mean, you say early on that words are the only things that remain to hold the dark at bay. Oh, yes. Well, isn't that true for writers? But then, you know, <laughs> words are where we live. Words are where we make our lives and we make our society, we make our civilization. I've said many times, boringly so, I'm sure, but the sentence is the greatest human invention. Uh, and, you know, there have been societies that didn't have the wheel, but they had to have the sentence because this is, our laws are graven in sentence. Our, we declare war, we declare love, we declare peace in the sentence. Everything we do is a sentence. Uh, we speak to each other, we communicate with each other, we make ourselves felt literally felt through sentences. And it's been my great privilege all my life to, to work with this essential invention of the human species. So, um, you know, uh, my computer right now is propped up on your book, so I don't have the book in front of me, but the very first line uh, mentions the idea of a sentence, but it also plays with the idea of a sentence. And then the book moves towards the singularity of the full stop um at 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 the end um but that sentence actually brings up uh freddie montgomery uh, a, 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 ver a very much beloved character of yours and 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 you sort of alluded to it um uh, just a moment ago but this is um this is a a a big uh whisking of 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 so much of your work and bringing it together and there are little clues for those who uh, who who have enjoyed and reveled in your work for 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 for, for years there's going to be all sorts of little uh, nods and winks to 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 characters that are there including William JB and 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 Montgomery and all sorts of uh, all sorts of other little um uh, uh clues to 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 your previous work and you say that 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 this will be your last big uh, such work, um, although I hope it's not. Um, but um, how was it trying to pull in all those different strands? And do you have a few things sewn in the very deep, deep corners that not even the best readers will get? Yes, I think there are references in there that even I won't get. But, you know, I don't want, I wouldn't want the book to seem like a sort of a jigsaw puzzle, you know, an Irish Times yeah, hard crossword puzzle. It's not. It's meant to, as I say, to delight. And I'm not just trying to sell the book uh, in this care the book sells or not. But I, I wouldn't want it to seem solemn in any way. You know, I always say that art is a serious enterprise, but never solemn. Solemnity is the death of art. So I want readers to enjoy this book. I want them to revel in it. I don't want them to feel that they must go back and read all the other books. It would be nice if they did, but I can't, can't imagine many of them will. And certainly I couldn't revisit my own work, so I had to do it all from memory. I probably got it all wrong. But it, yes, it's a bit of a romp in a way. Um, but John, it's a serious romp too. I mean, it is. Yes, of course it's a serious romp, but it's, as I say, it's not it's not a it's not a crossword puzzle it's not solemn it's not it's not hard work you don't have to you know i would dread to think that people sit down and say no, I, I must i must read this and i must get this reference and that reference that's not the point at all the point is to the point is delight uh, to delight in the playfulness the seeming the easy playfulness i mean you know as well as i you write a book and it's <laughs> very hard work and very boring most of the time. And I sit down every morning, every single morning I sit down and I think, I don't know how to do this. I just don't know how to do this. I don't know how I did it yesterday or the day before. How on earth am I going to do it? How am I going to get started? And then I write a few words and I play around with them. But by mid-afternoon, I'm, I'm deep into it and I've forgotten myself and somebody else has taken over. 
and there's somebody else who's taken over is writing a book that that I didn't know how to do. Um, you know, there's there's always <laughs> always amuses me. If I do public events, you know, I used to do readings and now it's all interviews and so on. And people would come up to me afterwards and I could see them as they approached the desk where I was signing the books. I could see them saying, my God, he's very short. He's much older than I expected him to be. He's not very good looking. And <laughs> I want to say to them, look, the person who wrote that book is not the person sitting here. Mm. When... John Vanberg gets up from his desk at the end of the working day. He ceases to be, and then somebody else takes over. Mm. My late wife would say, yes, then the murderer takes over, you know. So the glass of wine in the evening makes me, allows me to pretend to be human again. Um, this is the writing life. It's, you know, it's, it's a, in a way I'd love to have been an artist in, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, where the notion of the artist didn't exist. You were simply, you know, you were somebody who was working for the, 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 the um, Count of Montefeltro, or you, you, you know, or one of the Medici's, or one of the high kings of Ireland, and you were just doing your work. Nobody, you were a servant in the house. You know, Haydn used to wear livery when he was working for the for the whoever it was he was working for. Um, I would like to get back to that. Uh, I think there's much too much attention given to the notion of being the writer, being the artist. Yeah. Um, However, though, John, would you say that, 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 I mean, the position of the artist, the contemporary social artist in particular, the, 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 but um, uh, the artist in, in, in general um, is sort of diminished and, and that uh, really one has to work out of more of a reckless inner need now then um you know then uh, you don't find the writer at the center of uh, you know the debate as she or he or they used to be uh, and so this this recklessness that you must undertake has also given given birth to some 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 great works of art yes i, I uh, certainly our day well, you're younger than me, but my day has passed. In my day, a new novel by even Norman Mailer, you know, was a great event. Right. Uh, or a new book of poems by Elizabeth Bishop. Or uh, yeah, this was just this was just something happening in the world. Now it is reduced to. Uh, a, it's social relevance. And social relevance is the death of art. You know, we're going through a bad time. It will end. The young people now will grow up and they'll realize that, you know, their great concerns at the moment are not necessarily concerns that will last. You have to be very careful here. Because I, you know, I, I am looking for a way to be canceled, but not sure that I want to be canceled quite yet. So I have to be careful, but it is a, but then, you know, perhaps it's good that writers and artists in general should be taken down a peg. Maybe we should be told, you know, your ego is your business, not our business. Um, my, my late wife used to say to me, you know, and I would say to her at least three times, you know, I'm giving it up. I'm just, I'm, I can't do it anymore. And she'd say, oh, yeah. What do you do then? You go into politics and destroy the world. Uh, and if you look at the history of the 20th century, the great monsters were, <laughs> a Jewish friend of mine says, if only they'd let Hitler into that uh, art teaching college, art academy in Linz, you know, in the 90s, we wouldn't have had Second World War. And certainly, the failed artist is a very, very dangerous creature. Uh, you know, Stalin wanted to be a poet. Bao wanted to be a poet. Paul Pot, I think, wanted to be a poet. Mm. Who knows? Maybe even Putin has a slim volume of verse hidden away in a drawer somewhere. Uh, we should publish it. Uh, you know, 
<laughs> given the Nobel Prize. The point I'm making is that the, 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 the artistic ego is, it has to be a very strong force in the world. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't keep at it day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. You know, at least twice a week, I look up from my desk and I say, what am I doing here? Why am I telling these ridiculous lies? Well, I tell it this. But then, but then it, it, all of us, all readers, our children at bedtime, we all want a story. We all want to be told something that will both divert us, but also terrify us. It's the great power of the, the old uh, fairy tales, the Grimm, if you, if you read the Grimm brothers' tales, they're terrifying, they're very, very dark. Or Hans Christian Andersen, you know, you read the, the Little Mermaid, these are very, very frightening, because what children need to be given is both diversion, both entertainment, and a clear picture of just how terrible life is, how beautiful life is, and how enjoyable, and, but also how terrifying the world is. Uh, and that's what stories are for. And, you know, you and I and the other people who make art, make literature, this is one of the, this is one of our functions in the world is to, to tell the stories that are realistic. No, not even really, but are truthful. Truth is more, truth is more valuable than mere realism. Right. You so, know, uh, yeah, truth, let's, let's talk. Truth transcends fact. Yeah, let's let, let's talk talk a little bit about uh, uh, about that. Um, and you know, um, you're talking about stories and storytelling. Um, of course, um, we could get rid of the book. We could get rid of uh, uh, of all sorts of things, but we'll never get rid of stories. We have a deep need. Everyone has a deep need uh, to tell those stories. Those stories legislate um, our lives, and many of those stories are sort of uh, made up or supposedly made up. Uh, you know, and one of the questions of our age is the question of what's true, what's not, what's a fact, what's not. Facts become mercenary things that can be packed off to wherever uh, you want them to go. Um, there's a tension between, um, you know, fiction and, 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 and supposed non-fiction, uh, which I find interesting. I personally doubt the word fiction, um, but I wonder uh, how you feel about the tension between fact and fact fiction, truth, all of these the, 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 these terms that are coming up, not only in the realm of literature, but obviously in the realm of, uh, of politics um, and unfolding uh, sometimes horribly in front of us today. Yeah, well, I think that it goes back to language. Uh, the tyrant loves shoddy, careless, deceptive, self-deceiving language. It feeds into the tyrant's sense of himself, herself. It feeds into his or her supporters, you know, they're able to lie to themselves. And it's part of our job is to keep the language not only pure, but to keep it vivid and rich uh we and i do think that you know we're a guild in the old sense the old medieval sense of a guild that the goddess are part of a guild we're first of all crafts people and after that we can when, when we've learned our craft we can maybe call ourselves artists but the craft part of it is we learn precise language we learn the truth and the authenticity and the solidity, the graspability of language. And that's one of the things that, that in our time, and look, you know, we're all very depressed at the moment, you know, but our time won't last all that long. Something new will come along. Uh, it does feel now very like 1930s, as all the sort of low dishonest decade. Uh, and we're having that at the moment, but 
He began riots uh, in Second World War. They defeated fascism. I do think that, <laughs> you know, I do feel that wicked as we are as a species, I think that we will, I think we we'll defeat the powers of darkness that are stalking through the world at the moment. I hope so. I hope for the sake of my children, my grandchildren, that will be the case. That's very, um, that's very Gramsci of you, like uh, Antonio uh, Gramsci who talked about being a, a pessimist of uh, reality and an optimist of the will. In other words, you, you look at the world, you recognize how, how, how dark it is, um, and, uh, and yet, um, you know, the cynic does does not win 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 out. There's there's a pez optimist in 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 John Banville that I that 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 I see uh, working, um, but I I do feel also that thrill of what you just said about moving away, using words, using language to to to, to find whatever available light there happens to be. And as I say, that is our that is part of our business. Our main business is to write works to please ourselves. This is where we start. I write for myself, you write for yourself. Uh, by some magical coincidence, other people find something in the thing that we've done for ourselves. This is the I mean, people come to me after readings and they say, you know, that book was real, that book spoke to me. This is a marvelous thing. You know, and I, you know. No matter how many books one sells, one only has, you know, I think I have a couple of thousand readers. And readers are almost as rare as, good readers are almost as rare as good writers. Uh, and every reader remakes the work. There are, I, there are as many versions of the singularities, this book of mine, as there are readers to read it. Each reader will remake it for himself or herself. And I love that because it's not my business anymore. It's now everybody else's. This is one of the reasons I don't read reviews or read anything about myself. I don't care. It's gone into the world. Uh, so you're but, extending but, the infinity. Hmm? You're extending the infinity. Yeah. I, yeah, I think, you know, but as I say, it is our business whether we like it or not, to keep language vivid and vibrant and subtle. Right. Well, you know, I'm not talking about literary language. Uh, a good conversation around a dinner table with a glass of wine. You know, we start off with people saying, oh, yes, it, it, it rained today, good heavens, and yes, and um, how are your children? I'm, an hour later, after a glass of wine, people are talking about very subtle, complex things. It's one of the great, one of the great pleasures of being alive is engaging with other human beings. Um, <laughs> I remember when I was very young and my wife and I were together first, we, we were coming back from some dinner party. She said to me, do you realize you didn't say a single thing all evening? And I said, well, nobody was saying anything interesting there. She said, you can't do that. You can't do that. And I learned that she was right. One has to engage in the human comedy, in the human tragedy, however banal we may think it to be. Uh, it's not banal. It's, it's this extraordinary place that we're in. Um, it's an extraordinary world, and human beings can always, always surprise us. Um, you know, I, I, I think that I know, I, I have this fantasy that there's a, somebody is sent from a planet the other side of the galaxy to come and do a report on Earth, right? And the alien comes and spends a week here, you know, goes to dinner parties, goes to galleries, talks to people like you and me, you know, goes to factories, writes a, you know, yeah, incredibly powerful brain, bigger than ours, writes up this voluminous report. He's about to leave, 
and somebody sneezes or somebody yawns. He goes, what's this? Why is that person making an extraordinary noise? Why is that person doing that silent scream? And has to cancel the whole thing and start again. We are infinitely various. Mm-hmm. It's a wonderful thing about the world. It's infinitely various. It is never, ever exhausted. I've lived for 76 years on this earth. It still baffles me. It still fascinates me. I, I never, ever get used to it. This is the strangest place. You know, we're not our... I always feel that you know, people talk to me about, you know, the singularity, it's an alternative universe. This is an alternative universe. Yeah. I live in an alternative universe. I, I don't recognize this place. I never recognize it. And then, you know, you go to bed at night, you've had a day of dealing with people and get all this strange in yourself. You go to bed, you think, I've been arrested. And then you start dreaming. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole other world. We have two worlds that we live in, the world of the waking, the world of sleeping. Last night, I took a, some kind of sleeping pill that reacted in some strange. I had four or five absolutely fascinating dreams. Whole other world. Um, isn't it fascinating? I mean, and I suppose this is why I write, and I'm sure why you write, and why any artist makes things, makes objects in order some way to account for the strangeness and the mysteriousness of this place we find ourselves in. It's a very strange place. I always, I'm sure people are getting bored by now, I always use the example of the sky. We live under the sky and you look up and if all that stuff is cleared away, you're looking into infinity. You're standing on the surface of a little ball spinning, and you're looking into infinity. And it's a clear day, and then suddenly all this canned smoke comes up from the horizon, clouds. I look at that and think, this is an astonishing thing. And I read recently that a really big cloud contains as, as much power as a hydrogen bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. So these beautiful satiny things that are floating over us, they're full of immense, immense destructive power. And we live with them in perfect harmony. It's like living with wolves, bears, the animals that would kill us if they could, not out of any personal animosity, but just to eat us. I love the. I love no, the I'm trying to express it, the strangeness of being here. Yeah, no, I love the fact that you retain your your ability to 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 be astonished. Um, do you think? Uh, you know, do you, you, any artist does. This right. is we live in a state of astonishment. Right. Uh, do you think you 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 have lived it as well as you would have wanted to to live it to this particular point? Well, I'd like to have done things differently, but of course, if I had the chance again, I would do it all in exactly the same way. Um, yes, I've lived. I mean, I've, I've, I've done my best. I've, I've hurt people. I've treasured people. I've, God, I feel, I feel I'm 96 rather than 76. <laughs> doing my, my valediction to the world. I have a few years left, I hope. But uh, yeah, I think um, I think I've got as much out of it as I could have. But that is not due to myself, it's due to the people who have loved and treasured me, especially the women. I was <laughs> telling the story that years ago I did a uh, gave a talk at the University of Lyon in France and it was at midday and there was a lunch afterwards. The lunch was 13 men in an upstairs room. It was, you know, the, the yeah. travesty of the Last Supper. <laughs> and as it went on, I thought, this is my idea of hell. All eternity with 13 men in an upstairs room. 
eating French food. One woman would have changed everything. Right. Right. The entire place would have changed. All the men would, you know, they wouldn't have been all that different, but the subtle difference you would have made. So, or a young person. Everything I've learned from from somewhere else. I don't like the young. No, 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 no. <laughs> the young are always these handicapped adults, you know. No, I like the young. I think I think there's something happening uh, right now. There's something there's something abroad in 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 uh, in a sort of emergent movement, um, and there's a power and uh, and a swing that and a questioning of what has gone on, um, you know, beforehand. And uh, you know, I'm I'm quite excited about that. I'm also excited. Oh, come about on, Colm, you're just pandering to the young. I'm not pandering. I'm not pandering. They're the same as they always were. They're the same as we were when we were young. Well, we'll see. Young, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might be right, but you might you, also you might be wrong. Um, you know, you, 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 I the, might be wrong. You might be wrong. You might be wrong. Um, it's like that old song. No, but the Greta Thunbergs of 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 the world who were prepared to you know get up and walk out of the classroom and say enough of this shit and 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 um uh, you know to 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 start, uh you know throwing quest the proper questions um around. I'd like to see more of that, and and I think the technology that we have at our fingertips, uh, makes that sort of thing available. And I'm really interested in what you said because I want to open it up to the the the, the questions that, that for, from the audience. But what you said about this is your last of this sort of uh, of, of of novel, um, and um, uh, you know, I, and I said I hope it's not. Um, you know, the Singularities is 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 a fantastic book for everybody who's out there. You've got to go go read it. Um, it's pure pure John Banville in in every sense. It's playful. It's it's insightful. It's 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 uh, profound. Um, and it's all of these things that are that that are working uh, all at once. But what is this new sort of territory that you're 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 sort of going to um, step yourself into? Well, I don't know. I keep writing my crime books, which I quite like because they're it's craft work, uh, and it's enjoyable. I will find something else to do, but it won't be this kind of book. Um, you know, I've done my I've done my work in this in this genre in this form. Uh, I'll find something else. Are we talking about like filmmaking, play, plays? Uh... Maybe so, I don't know. I mean, you know, my, my wife died almost a year ago and I found myself in strange kind of limbo uh, since then. Um, and I, <laughs> she'd be so amused. She said, you can't work without me. Mm. Uh, I felt, certainly for the first six months, I couldn't work at all. I couldn't do anything. Um, but now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I won't say I'm coming out of mourning. I'm coming into a different stage of mourning. Mourning is very interesting. I mean, it's awful, it's painful, but it is also interesting. You discover things about yourself and about the world and about the people that you loved, people that, one does love. I am in mourning for my wife, of course, but I'm in mourning also for all the things that went with her, a, a, a whole version of life that went with her. So I'm at a pivotal stage <laughs> in my old age. But I'm, I'm in my, my late second adolescence. Yeah. Second childhood is rapidly coming my way. I'll do something. It doesn't matter. There's a question on here that actually relates to 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 to, to your, your wife, and I'm trying to I'm trying to unpack the question, um, and and um and and figure out where where some of the 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 the, the commas go, and maybe you you can un, un, unpack this question better than than I can. But it says, Mr. Banville was your late wife. Perhaps she still is your copy editor. You being as a writer just the reporter, and that's from Paul Barnes. That's a good question. It's a good question. Yes, she was. She was. She had perfect pitch. Uh, she, especially in the early days, I would give her something to read as I was working on it, and she'd say, "Oh, that's very good." And I'd say, "God, is it that bad?" Uh, and she would take me aside now and then when I. I thought I'd finished a book and she'd say, John, you haven't finished this, you know, go back and work on it for another year or two. And she was always right. Um, 
But you know, I have no, I have I have two daughters by another woman, Patricia Quinn, who introduced me to a whole other world of music, of, of other art forms that I wouldn't have been in. Again, I say that anything I've learned in life, anything I've gained from life has been given to me by women. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wish I could say otherwise, and of course I have a few male friends and I love them dearly, but they don't give me what, what women gave me. From my mother on, you know, through my mother, my sister, my wife, my lovers, uh, my daughters, and my sons. I mean, I must mention them as well, because I hope they're not watching. Uh, but I do think that the female principle has been the one of the great moving forces in my life. Uh, perhaps I'm half woman. I hope I am. Perhaps you we know. all are. I would like to be too. too. Can I? Uh, uh, there's a question from a woman on 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 here, Diane uh, Burnoff, who asks, um, following on from what you're just saying, what do you think? of the idea of a muse and was your wife a sort of muse? Oh no, I wish, I wish I could say, but the muse doesn't exist. This is a, this is a, this is a male fantasy developed by the, by the Greeks uh, and carried on by the Romans and then really developed by the romantics, but there is no muse. There's only, the, the muse, the imagination is the muse. The imagination is our greatest faculty. Without the imagination, we would be nothing. Uh, we would be, I mean, you know, people talk to me about the coming age of robots and artificial intelligence, but the thing that the robots and artificial intelligence, imagination, because imagination can entertain six different things at the same time. And I always think that robots and artificial intelligence, they won't have a sense of humor. A sense of humor and the imagination are very closely allied. They depend on each other. Uh, so no, there, there is no muse. Right. So much of our, our, our lives, John, they, uh, can be mapped and, 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 and then monetized, you know, what, you know, where we go, the sites we visit, uh, the things we read, the, the, the way we dress, the, the cars we buy, the houses, whatever else. But, but, but um, the imagination can't be accessed um, in that way and it can't be monetized um, in, in, in that way. Do you, do you ever see a future when, 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 when these outside forces will have some sort of weird access to uh, our, our imagination, to our consciousness? Um, and, 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 and be able to, to, to change I don't, the future? I don't know enough about the coming world. Um, I talked to a, one of these tech people recently, a kind of genius, uh, I liked him enormously. Um, and he was saying that, yes, artificial intelligence is dangerous. Uh, it can do things that we can't do. It can move us to places that we, will, we don't want to be in. But I said to him, yeah, but a robot can't cross the street because it can't look both ways, you know. <laughs> Put eyes on both sides of his head and... and, 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 and... Yeah, but so what? <laughs> It'll get one over anyway. Um, we're not robots. If we are to perish as a species, and it would be good for the world, it'd be good for the planet if we did, if we're to perish, we will have left an extraordinary testament behind us. Look what we did. Look what we did. We're poor, forked creatures. We crawled out of the sea. We climbed down from the trees. We freed ourselves in the caves. And then we did wonders. We did wonders. And we did terrible things, but I always say for every Hitler, there are two Beethovens. Uh, we've done, in terms of culture, we've done better than we ever could have been expected. Unfortunately, 
in terms of our rapaciousness and our greed and our heedlessness. We're destroying this beautiful, beautiful planet that we were given to live on. We are the most dangerous virus. Lauren, Lauren Isley says we, 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 we love the earth, but, but, but we could not stay. Um, but what will stay behind um, beyond our stories or are our stories the only thing that will remain of us when, when, when we are gone? No, I think that if, you know, if, if there's a great cataclysm and the whole thing has to start up again from the caves, from a few starving people making, remaking a civilization, what will remain of us is a great heroic story. Mm -hmm. Look what they did. Look how limited they were. Look what poor creatures they were. You know, a dog has a sensor in the top of its snout that can detect one molecule of a scent. One molecule. Our dogs and cats, they can see in the dark. We're stumbling around, bumping into things. They're looking at us and saying, look at the fools, they can't see. They're infinitely more gifted than we are. But when I'm sitting reading a book, my dog is sitting in front of me, looking at me, complete bafflement, saying, what is he doing? What is he doing? So we have that power of the imagination, which the animals whom I love and respect, I mean, I often think I prefer the other animals to the human animal, but we have that power of imagination and that power of, and that hunger to create. And you know, the poor old world is in a dreadful state, but I had a little, listening to a program on BBC recently, a science program, and I was only half listening to it because I was making my dinner. But somebody came up with an idea to fill the atmosphere with microscopic mirrors that will reflect the light back into space and therefore cool the planet. Just that, just the fact that somebody could conceive of this notion and some technician would come along and make that a reality. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? I mean, that's... Know, we're terrible creatures. We're, we, we slaughter each other. My God, the things we do to each other. And yet, we are capable of the most glorious uh, inventions. Just think you know, of the miracle of this conversation. I mean, our voices are literally bouncing around, being attached to light in underwater cables that are going from New York all the way uh, to 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 uh, Valencia Island, then bounced in fiber optic cables all the way to Dublin, almost instantaneously. And this great miracle that we have, in the, just in yeah. the simple fact that we can have. Imagine, this imagine Marconi conceiving of an underwater transatlantic cable, and you can imagine going along to his backers and saying, "Well, I have this idea. Um, you, know, you get this cable and you put it under the sea between here and New York," and they say, "What?" Cyrus Field did that, and you know they did it. The first underwater cables were back in what the eighteen fifties. Yeah. Uh, it's extraordinary. We are so you know. I would say to my children, I do say, don't lose hope. Mm. Don't lose hope and live life to its absolute fullest. I say to them, if you live your life to the fullest, you won't fear death, mm. because you will have done. He would have fulfilled the gift that was given to you. Uh, <laughs> I hear myself saying these absurd, they're not absurd, but they're kind of, uh, they're, they're portentous. I don't mean to be portentous. You know, life is simple. It's, at, its, at its best, it's simple. Well, that's, I think, Saying that is it is, is is a beautiful place for us to uh, to sort of rest and continue this conversation um, someday down the line, whether it be John in in Dublin, New York, or through the Philadelphia Library System, or uh, whatever it happens to be. But I got to thank you for this uh, for the conversation. But I also got to really thank you for the, all the work 
and 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 the joy of uh, of the singularities as well which is just uh, amazing so i tip my imaginary hat to you um across the ocean and uh, i wonder if you have any last words and then we'll 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 we'll, we'll say good night well i say you know there what last words would i have you know <laughs> i tell you here's a my one of my favorite anecdotes is of henry james when he was dying He's in a coma. He's gone as far as the people run, but his hand is still moving over the sheet. He's still writing. Mm. And I hope that that would be the same for me mm. and for you, that we will write the perfect sentence. No, we will read it. <laughs> take it with us into the land of the dead, but we will have done it. And if yeah. we want to make the perfect sentence, at the end. So. There you go. A singularity. Thank you, John Banville. Thank you, Colm. You're very generous. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Hope to see you soon. Hope to see you.